Our evening began in Peter Seychelles' comfortable study in his New York townhouse, where the candlelight was just right, the hi-fi was in the background, and the wine was delicious. Destroy! And was there anything of value in the car? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, a tape deck, some credence tapes. Now, for the last time, Mom, give me back my fucking drumsticks. Give me a beer! Give me water! Gee, if this gonna be that kind of party, I'm gonna stick my dick in the mashed potatoes. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the High Note Podcast. I am your host, Sean Smith. So this is my second podcast in my series from the 58th Annual Philadelphia Folk Festival. If you haven't already, uh, go ahead back and listen to the last episode, which features Steve Poltz, a great singer-songwriter who was uh, born in Canada, then made his way to California, and now he's been all over the country and all over the world. So uh, that's the last episode. So when you're done with this one, go ahead back and listen to that one. I'm releasing these in the order that I recorded them in. So I recorded the interview with Steve on Friday. And this interview with Dave Gunning, who is a singer-songwriter from Canada, I I recorded on Sunday. So um, actually, Steve Poltz was also a part of the workshop that I saw with Dave Gunning called Wheel Decide. And it was a pretty cool thing. It was over on the tank stage, which is one of the stages that are next to the main, the Martin Guitar main stage. And they had a large wheel with song ideas like um, song that I wish that I wrote or um, a song in less than three minutes, things like that. And they would get random people from the audience to come up and spin the wheel. And then all of the musicians would have to um, would have to uh, come up with a song that fit that criteria. And the workshop was great because it featured uh, not only uh, Dave Gunning and Steve Poltz, but it also featured uh, Matt, the electrician and Pete Mulvaney, too. So uh, it was really cool. So uh, Dave Gunning is not just a singer songwriter. He. um he actually is uh, is a bit of an activist too. So he is from Pictou County, which is in uh, Nova Scotia, and uh, I think he said it was near Prince Edward Island. So he in his hometown, there's been pollution from the Northern Pulp Mill, which is uh, uh, a paper mill, and it's putting all sorts of um, you know, it's basically just dumping toxins into the local waterways there. And it's polluting not only uh, the waterways and affecting the wildlife there, but it's also affecting the indigenous people who, um, who live off the land. And also it's affecting the fishing industry too. So um, definitely, definitely a worthy cause. And if you look in the show notes for this, you'll see links. So there's a link to Friends of the Northumberland Strait, uh, which is friends of the North Underland Strait dot ca. If you want to check that out, and then he also has a um, a Facebook group called Clean Up the Picto County Pulp Mill. Uh, links to both of those things are going to be in the show notes, as are links to DaveGunning dot com. And uh, for his latest album, it's called Up Against the Sky, and uh, you'll see there there will be a link, and you can go check out that album. It's also available uh, anywhere you uh, anywhere you check out your music. He also has a tour that's going to take him all the way through Canada throughout September. He tours across the throughout the world, but this uh, this this tour right now that he's on is going to take him basically all through Canada. So if you're up that way, uh, friends of Canada, please go check out Dave Gunning. He is absolutely amazing. Go check out his album up against the sky. Uh, please go give out, give that Facebook page a like, not only his Facebook page, but, um, the, uh, clean up the Picto County pulp mill and check out the friends of the Northumberland Strait. And while you're at it, if you did listen to the Steve Poltz interview, or if, if you've if you're a fan of the High Note, maybe you want to go on iTunes and leave a review. Just search for the High Note, and you'll it'll come right up, and you can just uh, leave a review. Or if you look in the show notes, I'll leave a link to that there too. And uh, if you go to highnoteblog.com, 
there's uh there's links there too so check out anything and uh and leave a review it definitely helps you can also follow me on any social media platform at high note blog and um I also started a donation thing. So if you if you want to donate to the podcast, that would be awesome. I'd really appreciate it. I decided to break it down into a fun thing. Um, a beer at my local bar is $4. Uh, and a cup of coffee at Ventner Coffee is about $2. So uh, I'm going with 2 and $4 uh, donations right now. So if you, if you want to buy me a beer, a $4 donation would definitely go towards the bar tab. Or... Uh, if you think I've had enough and I should sober up a little bit, a $2 donation will buy me a cup of coffee at Ventnor Coffee. So that's it for me. I really hope that you enjoy my interview with singer-songwriter Dave Gunning. Dave Gunning, welcome to the High Note Podcast. How are you doing today? Good, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, man. So singer-songwriter Dave Gunning, all the way from Canada, correct? Yep, based in Nova Scotia, Atlantic Canada. Okay. And, and uh, So yeah, just thrilled to be back this way. Yeah. Came down here to thaw out. Actually, we've had a good summer at home, too. That's great, man. Yeah. Now, is this, uh, where are you from exactly in Canada? A place called Pictou County, Nova Scotia. Pictou so County. It's, it's uh, right across the Northumberland Strait from Prince Edward Island, and about an hour and a half from Halifax, okay. and an hour and a half from Cape Breton, so it's a nice area. I, I actually grew up there and, and uh, still live there now. So uh, I heard the uh, I heard Steve Poltz mention that you were the pride of your of your hometown county. Do you guys go back? Because I know he's from Nova Scotia. Is that correct? He yeah. Well, Steve's moved around. Like he's Steve's had a, quite an interesting life. You know, oh, yeah. spent a lot of his time in L.A. and I think he's in Nashville now. Uh, but uh, has he has East Coast connections to Cape Breton and uh, Halifax, and uh, very yeah, very much familiar with the area. He's uh, what he's a just what an awesome guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Now, is this your first time to the Philadelphia Folk Festival? It's my second time. I was here three years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah, three or four years ago. Great. Yeah. Well, what is your impression of the Folk Festival? Uh, well, it, it's it. it uh, I, I guess. I mean, I grew up inspired by a lot of American singer songwriters, whether whether it be Dylan or Pete Pete Seeger or Woody Guthrie. Some of the original stuff where it all sort of began for me, and uh, it feels like you're coming to the motherland of where. Where the mu- music that that I've been inspired by was birthed, you know, in so many ways, and I mean, there are there are old folkies walking around the crowd here who, you know, who know Dylan, who knew Pete, who knew Woody, and it's quite a legacy. You sort of feel like you're really stepping into uh, part of the deep and important legacy of American folk music, and uh, it's an honor to be to be here. Yeah, it's an honor to have you, and I have to point out you're wearing a Stan Fest shirt. Yeah. Um, it, how does uh, Stan Rogers incorporate? You know, he's a the pride of Canada. Let's stomp yeah. Tom Connors. I mean, you yeah, know, the... I toured with Stomp and Tom. Did I, you really? I, I played upright bass for Tom in no. 2002. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, and uh, Stan, my first live concert that I ever saw in my life was Stan Rogers. I was eight years old. It was two years before he passed away, and I think that that's a big part of the reason why I started writing songs. Stan is my favorite songwriter, and uh, I think I've got a soft spot for him because I saw him. He was my first experience seeing live music, but I, you know, and it, I've played the Stan Rogers Festival, um, you know, pretty well every year for the last 20, 21 or twenty-two years, and uh, it's yeah, Stan. He he went way too soon. And, yeah. And uh, it was eighty-three when he passed. I and I've played the Kerrville Folk Festival seven times now, where Stan sang his last song. Oh wow. Yeah. So he was coming home from Kerrville. So if you mention Stan's name at Kerrville, a lot of the older folks there they get watery eyed, you know, because yeah. they remember Stan. They they fell in love with him, and and a lot of people convinced Stan to stay one extra day, you know, so that he could be part of this. Of you know, much like Philly folk festival here there's a lot a lot of the magic that happens as you know is in the campgrounds late at night Mm -hmm. just like people singing their songs around around the campsites and yeah and that's pretty pretty big important part of the Kerrville festival too but yeah Stan Rogers do you have a favorite uh I hate to put you on the spot here uh but do you have a a favorite Stan Rogers song I think the white squall maybe is my favorite one okay any particular reason Uh, it's just written so well It, it it's unbelievable. It's it's like an an intense movie that happens all within the four minutes. It, it, it's so descriptive. I, I think the first song that I that I gravitated towards was uh, the Marianne Link, Mar- Marianne Carter, which is you know another song like that. The White Squalls. It's just beautiful. Yes. Yeah. 
The Mary Ellen Carter is one of my favorite songs ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. I mean, it is, It uh, anytime I hear it, it completely just captivates me. Um, and Unbelievable. It, the vocabulary was huge. Yes. He was our greatest historical writer, I think, ever. Yeah. yeah. And as a writer of myself, the way that he can paint a landscape and paint a picture and it makes you feel like you're right there. I mean, in the Mary Ellen Carter, you feel like that you are, you know, one of the seamen there, yeah. ready to rise that boat up again. Yep. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Every jar that hit the bar, you know, <laughs> swore we would remain to make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Yeah, it took me a while to interpret that song. And, of course, you know, I'm a music writer and stuff and podcaster, so I have to go too deep on everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I first had seen it as a... Um, as like a love song, you know, like a real love song for the Mary Ellen Carter. Yeah. But then I realized that it's almost bittersweet. Yeah. You know, that I didn't get that bitterness at first, you know, the scene in the bar and, you know, and yeah. every glass that hits the jar or every yeah. jar that hits the bar. Yeah, all the insurance company made their money yep. on it. The, own, yeah. the owners gave up on it. And but it was the it was it was the crew that that sailed sailed the ocean with that boat that formed the attachment, that love it's like a love story that the bond, the love, the love affair with the boat, you know? Yeah. Instead, what's interesting about Stan Rogers music is that Stan was the first, he was an Ontario born guy, but he spent summers in Atlanta, Canada, and he was the first uh, folk writer in the country that could make the tough, uh, you know, seamen of Atlantic Canada cry. Like a lot of the toughest fishermen in Canso, the, you know, he could make a Kanzo boy cry singing about, uh, uh, you know, the Genie Sea, a lost boat, or the Mary Ellen Carter. He had just such power in his in his writing, and and uh, and I, I I'm very fortunate. I've, I've become really good friends with Garnet Stan's brother, and Garnet Garnet Rogers is one of my favorite artists in the world. He's very he's a very important songwriter and an activist. He does you know writes a lot about social justice issues or environmental concerns and talks about it bravely at his shows carrying on that that real tradition of Woody Guthrie or Pete Seeger or Ani DeFranco like those writers that are just brave and uh, I find that inspiring and I just feel so fortunate to have, have formed such a great uh, a great friendship with Garnet he's been so good good to me over the years oh that's wonderful now do you you said this is the second time at the festival um, have you seen any familiar sights up in the campground or is it all a new experience have you had a chance to walk up in the camp i actually haven't it. been there yet okay I, I was a little late getting in the first night and then i was busy yesterday i'm probably going to wander around there a bit today oh you mean yeah. you, you mean you're here working or something i thought you were just yeah, a spectator yeah. It, it's, it's uh yeah i almost feel guilty you know getting paid to do this to be honest I, i'm so lucky to be able to do it yeah that's great you know and and your workshops all your sets have been really good so far have you, have you yeah. enjoyed them yeah, absolutely. That last one we just did was so much fun. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. It just, it's a great, great camaraderie, and it, it's the folk festivals that keep us uh, artists together as family. It's, it, it's the these are the family reunions all summer long. We're doing the festival circuit, and you, you keep those bonds tight between you and your peers, and it's such a supportive and beautiful community. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you learn from one another and. You end up getting together, say, "Hey, man, we should write a song," or you know. Yeah. It's it's such a it it, it these these festivals are so important uh, because of that. Absolutely. Yeah. There is a feel of uh, camaraderie here uh, yeah. that that I feel like that the folk festival is kind of like an oasis um, in the sense that like you can have that sense of freedom. There's uh, a little bit more looseness here than I think at other festivals. If you go to the corporate ones, like the Fireflies and the, you know, then it's like strictly business for yeah, everybody so involved. It, it feels like sometimes uh, certain events can feel more isolated in a way, but this is such a together togetherness feel. Absolutely. Now, um, you, you mentioned... Um, you just got done a workshop here. Is it, would you call it a round or a workshop? Uh, I don't know. I guess, well, either either yeah. or, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was wheel to side. Have you ever been a part of anything <laughs> no. like this before? So no, was, yeah. so we spun the so people were spinning wheels with uh, topics for songs. Yeah, and so you, <laughs> had, you had to sing a song about that topic. So yeah. it was like every, every spin was a surprise. So yeah. um, uh, let's not... Uh, let's not cut to the ending, though. But uh, how did you how did you come up with the songs along the way? Before we talk about the last song that you performed, well, just just um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, like, the, I guess in a way, like when when they spin the, the wheel, there's sort of like you can kind of sort of follow somewhat close to to it. Uh, 
But uh, they they said, you know what, just do your, don't stress about it, you know. Okay. But uh, but it it kind of made it for an interest. But that's what the festivals are like. Oftentimes you you get to a workshop and. Sometimes I don't look ahead to see what the theme is, so I'll be sitting down, <laughs> sitting down. I was like, "Hey, what? Do you know what the theme of this workshop is?" You know? <laughs> and then you try, you try to pick songs that are appropriate to that. Yeah. But the, these things are so laid back, and you can kind of like, I mean, you can, this one of the beautiful things about coming to a folk festival like this one is that you can kind of do anything. Like you could wear your underwear in your head, and no one's really going to look <laughs> sideways. It's like, hey, that guy's got his underwear in his head. That's I think awesome. I saw that guy up yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just, and that's what's so beautiful about these. I mean, you, you look around the crowd. It's like the it's like the Muppet Show on steroids around here, right? <laughs> it's like you don't know what you're going to see. You walk through the woods. It's like, is this Fraggle Rock or the Philadelphia <laughs> Folk Festival? It just makes it so much fun and and uh, exciting, and everybody everybody's just full full of love and excitement. Everybody's happy to be here, and it, there's like not much separ- there's no separation between uh, the performers and the audience mm-hmm. you're all together it's like everybody's playing role in 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 this crazy train rolling down the the, the track here yeah yeah that's amazing now um, uh, have you have you had any inter- interesting interactions with people in the crowd throughout the festival Anything oh yeah memorable? absolutely uh, I, I, I spoke with a, with a guy um, uh, he had Canadian connections and uh, American connections and he we were talking about places in Canada, places in Ontario, and then uh, he noticed some uh, stickers or uh, 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 actually, what would I call this? A badge on the inside of my guitar case, anyway. Okay. And said, "Hey, you were to I, I went to Afghanistan to sing for the troops there. Oh, really? And I, 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 I would say that I'm more of the folky, hippie, anti-war type of type of fellas, but." Then I heard Bruce Coburn had been there six times. I thought, well, shit, I can go then. <laughs> so, so, and I went to uh, Kandahar and sang uh, the national anthem for Remembrance Day service. Wow! And it was a really bizarre one. It was uh, I met a guy named Colonel Petraeus, and he yep. was he was uh, from Texas, I think. And he he said that this event is to celebrate um, American soldiers that served under Canadian command, and I didn't know that that was a thing, but. Apparently, some of the missions in Afghanistan were led by Canadians, and uh, so I went over to sing Remembrance Day service and then did a concert uh, in Kandahar with my friend George Canyon from Canada, and then George ended up getting sick, and I went to Kabul the next day, or Kabul or whatever the, how they pronounce that, and and uh, but it, it was quite a quite an experience. Um, so yeah, that guitar case that we're looking at here on the table, <laughs> it's been all over the place, and and. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, we ended up having this chat with this guy today who, who said, "Well, good on you. You know, we we send um, we we were sending things over to the troops, and he said one thing we're sending was these laser keychains that looked like it was a laser gun. So if they didn't have, because the Canadians don't have the resources and the equipment's old, so they had these lasers that they could just shine to scare somebody, sure. rather than fire a gun, yeah. and just shine the laser, and it it would actually could could get them out of a jam." Is that the most Canadian solution? Ever? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, the Cana- they send the Canadians over to Afghanistan <laughs> with keychains, lasers. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> what year uh, did you do Kandahar? Yeah, I think do you it remember? was 2013, I think. My friend was in Kandahar, uh, but I think that was right at the end of his uh, time. I think he was wow. there in like 2010 to 2012 wow, type of thing. Wow, wow. Yeah, he was a CB. Uh, shout out to Anthony Ventura, my best friend from uh, second grade. Here's to and, him. Uh, yeah. yeah, cheers. Yeah, a little, a little toast. Bit. Absolutely. We're drinking uh, Yards, uh, Yards if you want to sponsor us. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. He, he went over there. He was a CB. He thought he was going to work on uh, tanks and stuff, and they put him on top of an MRAP, and he was uh, – Either leading the convoy or ending the convoy. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. A long, wow. uh, far, far cry from yeah. what he started doing, which was yeah. uh, taking yeah. apart engines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's just unreal. Yeah, just crazy, crazy experience. Now, you're, um, this is probably not the best segue, but uh, your last song, you, I don't want to say that you stole the show in the, uh, in the round here with, uh, you got a song in three minutes or less yeah. that you had to play. And uh, you chose one of my favorite songs, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Originally Woody Guthrie, but I'm a fan of the. It is originally yeah. Woody Guthrie, right? Uh, well, it was Marty Robbins who I heard do oh, it first. Oh, really? Uh, in Canada, that song was made famous by Marty Robbins, but I think it's a pretty long song. I heard it from the Grateful Dead. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I. Oh man, they they did everything. Those yeah. guys. Yeah. Unreal. <laughs> so you uh, you took a different route with your. Uh, with, with your version of it? Yeah, well, we only had a certain amount of time, so I, I shortened it. Uh, I tried to, tried to sum the story up, but, uh, yeah, out in the West Texas town of El Paso, 
I fell in love, I got shot, and I died. And I, I figured I'd end it there because that's pretty much what happened to the fella, really, when it comes right down to yeah. it. I mean, there's other details that I skipped over, I'll, uh, I'll confess. But at the end of the day, that's yeah. ultimately the conclusion of the song. And it certainly got me under the three-and-a-half-minute mark, which I felt very good about because a lot of my stories are over three-and-a-half minutes. So I didn't know what I was going to do. Well, you almost knocked every, every other performer on stage off out of their chair. Oh, jeez. Oh, everything that they did was unbelievable. The, like, the, the, all those artists are brilliant. Like, every single one of them I love. So I, w I was just th honored to be up there with, with the guys. Yeah. It, it's, it's moments like, like that where I, ju I just give my head a shake to think, I'm friggin' lucky, man. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I interviewed Steve Poltz yesterday. I don't know if you want to say any bad things about him. Uh, I can't. I can't. The guy is, the guy is unbelievable. He's... He's one of my favorite guys to share a stage with. He's Steve, you never know what he's going to do. He, he never knows what he's going to do. Every single Steve Poltz show is different, and it's magic. I've seen him play dozens of times, and every time it's magic. And he's just full of love. And when you're on stage with Steve, he's one of these guys, he's all about including everybody and making everybody... He hugs you the whole time you're on the stage with him. And he's got this gift of just doing that to, to his audiences as well. He's a he's a living legend, you know, and 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 uh, just a beautiful, beautiful human, right to the right to the core. I've known him, you know. I've been getting to know him. I actually met him in Australia. Oh wow! Because I've been I've played there three times, and the first my first two tours of Australia, Steve was on the gigs on the festivals there, and I I, I mean I knew who he was from from home, but I'd never really got to hang out with him. So we formed a a, a bond while we were over there, and I, I just. I love the guy. That's great. Well, I, you guys are very similar, I think, in your banter. Um, not exactly similar, but it, it seems like when you're up there, you don't know what you're going to say next. Yeah. And is that true? Like, do you, I understand that you have stories that you want to tell, but do you have them rehearsed at this point, or is, are uh, you there, feeling it? There's, like, bullet points that you might think, well, I should address that, and sometimes you do and you don't. Sometimes you forget, or sometimes another new bullet point sort of rears its head you end up going in a different direction with the stories but so they they evolve over time or there there, there could be something that happens at the show that that uh, changes the trajectory of your story a little bit and it kind of helps keep it fresh and I, I, I try to tell the stories in a similar way but I try to alter them every night just f to keep myself ex interested and sure. also if people have seen me before some you know, but it's funny. Like I, I was playing, <laughs> I was playing in Ontario years ago, and this old guy came up to me and said, uh, and I thought, you know, it was it was a bit of a different show. I thought I'm not going to tell the stories tonight. I, I just sing the songs because I thought maybe people are tired hearing the same stories, and I so I kind of skipped over some of the stories. So he comes up at the end of the show and says. Hey, how come you didn't tell the stories tonight? And I said, well, I thought maybe you were tired of hearing the stories, so I thought I'd just sing the songs. And he goes, yeah, well, I brought a buddy with me. <laughs> so I was like, well, sorry. You know? So, you know, sometimes I'll, uh, I'll thank the crowd, you know. Uh, I'll, you know, thank the crowd. I'll tell the, s the stories that maybe they've heard before and thank the crowd for bringing a buddy with them. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you come into a festival like this, and especially one that you've been to in the past, how do you approach your your set? Uh, well, I, I guess I kind of look at the main stage. Like I, I knew I had a main stage set and figured out, okay, how long do they want me to play for? And and sort of pick some songs, thinking, well, I don't want to do the same ones I did last time, but I have to do certain ones. I thought, and then uh, and then in the workshops, I would I would sort of pick different ones, so I'm not repeating myself. And uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Now, um, is there? Do you have anything that you want to plug, Dave? As far as a, a new album, or uh, um, now my well, audience? I have, oh, go ahead. I, I do. I do have, have a new record. Yeah, we it's, don't have to plug it if you don't want to. No, but I guess it's too late now. It. We've already let's talk I, about. We've it. already mentioned it, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> we might as well talk about it then, yeah, right? Well, we can't. It, it, we it, can't it, just tease people with a taste. Yeah, yeah. Hey, this guy's got an album. Yeah. Figure it out. That's right. <laughs> no, I, I I put the record out. Uh, uh, just last month, it's actually being released in the in the states here. We're going to send it out to some of the folk uh, DJs in the next couple of months. Great! And it's called "Up Against Up Against the Sky," and uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, it was a fun record to record because I I thought that they were just demos, so I didn't have the pressure on myself. And I I actually played drums on it myself, and I'm not a fabulous drummer, 
but the gardens naturally weed it by my lack of ability so <laughs> i didn't overplay that's for sure but <laughs> but but uh they're, and the drums are mic'd with two mics that are 12 feet away and i knew that i wanted to cut vinyl so I, I used room mics for everything i record it sort of the way that they would used to do records in the old days so I, I thought if i want a horn on it but i don't want the horn too loud i'll move the move it farther from the from the microphone there's actually only horns on one cut i don't know why i picked that example but but there's strings uh the atlantic string machine played on four cuts they're awesome from oh, prince wow. Edward island and uh you know some some acoustic guitar obviously a lot of mo mostly acoustic stuff and upright bass and uh, i tried to keep it very rootsy sounding and uh there's some electric guitars on it but the guitar m the guitar amplifiers are in a different room than the mics. Okay. So it gives you this real roomy kind of sound. Oh, cool. Yeah, it, it was. It, it just like we tried some different things and it, w w which worked, and it, w it was a fun record to make. And, and yeah, I just sort of didn't have. I wasn't putting pressure on myself. I thought, well, I'll just do some demos, and then some of my buddies heard them say, "Hey, man, like put those out." Yeah. Yeah. So we did. That's great. Anything, um, are, are you playing songs off the new record um, that are getting a lot of good response, or do you have a favorite song that you want to chat about a little bit? Uh, I, I guess the songs are kind of like kids in a way. You, know, <laughs> you can't pick a favorite, I, right? I play different ones uh, every show, but uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, I Wish I Was Wrong is a song that people at home um, like quite a bit. It, I, I've been involved the last 10 years of my life. I've spent a lot of time fighting uh, an environmental issue in my home town related to a bleach craft pulp mill called Northern Pulp, which uh, originally was was opened by Scott Paper back in the 60s, but four owners later, it's owned by Asia Pulp and Paper now, and uh, they've been polluting the area very, very badly, and uh, they've been dumping all their waste into a 400-acre lagoon oh, wow. that's dammed off from the Northumberland Strait, but it's called Boat Harbor. And it just happens to be in the middle of our one and only First Nation community that we have in our in our area. So I, I, I become very passionate about that. To be honest, I've spent more time on that than I have in my music career the last last ten years. I, I know more about bleachcraft pulp mills than I do about the folk music industry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a passion and uh, that's that has fueled a lot of my songwriting for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, yeah, been been quite a quite a journey, yeah. That's the that's the thing about songwriting, or really any writing in general, is that if you if you don't live life, you have yeah. nothing. You have no well to draw from. Man, I think what you said just just hit a spark in my my. You just spark something like because I originally when I took took this cause on, I was worried that it would stagnate my writing, that I would I would I wouldn't be writing songs because I'd be so busy. And I, I mean, I spent forty hours a week on this cause, researching, reading documents about pulp and paper and studying mills as they compare to uh, our mills it compares to other mills globally and uh, reaching out to scientists and doctors and and really doing a lot of work and I thought I'm never gonna write another song because I'm spending too much time on this but then I start I started writing songs because uh, and I it and it, it kind of makes sense with what you're saying if if you're passionate about something you'll be inspired Mm -hmm. So maybe the secret to inspiration is to find passion. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's the Steve Poltz thing, you know. He said, "I don't do anything I don't like." You know. Yeah. And it's like if everybody can live by that, yeah, you know, we would be a lot more. I would be a lot more creative. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My problem is that once I stop liking something, I stop doing it. But I don't know if that's a problem or if that's a good thing. You know. Well, you, maybe you're just you're allergic to boredom. You know, and you're <laughs> looking for the, the next thing, thing that's going to keep your interest. That's healthy too. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like my problem is I want to do everything. Yeah. yeah. yeah more everything. <laughs> where can people? Do you have a website that people can find out about this cause? Or where I, can I do. You, yeah. yeah uh, it's uh, the the Friends of the Northumberland Strait. So if if you Google the Friends of the Northumberland Strait. Um, you can read about our cause, or if you want to just, if you Google pulp mill pollution, I would guarantee that the first 20 Google hits that will automatically come up are related to most, mostly to our cause. Oh, great. And uh, th the la over the last 10 years, we've attracted the attention of Erin Brockovich, and now Ellen Page has been sharing my tweets. Oh, Anytime great. I tweet about the mill, she shares it. Uh, so we, we've, got, we've, we've gotten a lot of support from some pretty uh, influential people that are trying to help us out. It, the long and the short of, short of it is our pulp mill 
is the dirtiest one that we know of in the world. Wow. And we challenged the mill owners to find one worse. They use more water per ton of production than any other bleach craft mill that we know of globally. And they're releasing, there's more chemical oxygen demands in their effluents. So the, the median uh, color for effluent is 35 units and theirs 165. So they're, they're the dirtiest bleach craft pulp mill in the world that we can find anywhere. And one of the experts on our group travels all over the world and has worked in mills in, in China and in Indonesia and in Australia and Europe and the UK all over the place. He can't find a dirtier one anywhere on the planet. Wow. They d and ours is owned by an Indonesian company called Asia Pulp and Paper and they're running it into the ground. They've done very they've done little to nothing to address any environmental concerns but instead have boosted production and the re the way they've boosted production is that it, they've removed the redundancy in their engineering you're supposed to in a mill have redundancy equipment so if you have a failure in some of your systems you can switch valves over and switch to your backup systems mm -hmm. they have employed all their redundancy equipment to boost production oh. so the mill was designed to produce 500 metric tons and they can pump out a thousand metric tons per day wow. by boosting pr by re removing, removing the their redundancy equipment yeah. so the mill was, was yeah so it's it's running double capacity on the same old boilers that were put in there in 1967 oh, wow. they're running the guts out of the place and they're 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 running they're running the stacks with no filtration so they're polluting the air and they're ter they're polluting 90 million 90 million liters of fresh water every 24 hours wow. goes through that pulp mill they use more water every day than the city of Halifax uses wow so it's it's a real concern, and uh, it's a unique situation because the the province of Nova Scotia ha assumed responsibility for the pollution and signed an indemnity agreement, meaning the owners of the mill, past, present, and future, are off the hook for any environmental damages, oh, past, geez. present, and future. So it's a unique situation and yeah. one that we've been fighting hard, and uh, but we've g gathered the support. Uh, we've got over five thousand people on our Facebook page now which is clean up the Pictou County pulp mill that's okay. a Facebook page yep. and uh, we started a group called the clean the mill and another group called the friends of the Northumberland Strait and we're making some headway we're working very closely with our First Nation community now and uh, I was worried in the beginning that I would isolate myself from my, my community I thought well people are gonna stop coming to my shows when I play Pictou County but but uh, yeah, maybe that has happened to a degree but the friendships that I've formed through it all with uh, with people, when you're passionate about something and you share it in common with someone else, you form a real friendship over it. Yeah. And I formed some deep and meaningful friendships with members of my First Nation community, which I'm embarrassed to say I hadn't known before. So, if nothing else happens through this, it's brought a lot of us together in the community, and it hasn't really divided our community. It's brought us together. That's wonderful. And it's a beautiful thing, regardless of what happens. We hope that something positive will happen. But yeah, and is the goal to. Um put those fail safes in place to obviously the goal is to they reduce the amount of produce they're not going to do that they've been fighting us for 10 years trying to discredit our group mm -hmm. so they, they, the, the parent company has made a decision that the mill's not viable to invest in so they're not oh. going to invest in it they're just running it into the ground they're running it's like it an into old the car ground. an yeah. old factory an old yeah. car you're just running it until it dies they're, they're running it into the ground they don't care and uh so we don't really know what's going to happen. Eventually, the mill has to shut down. When Scott Paper opened it in '67, they said the mill is only going to be here for 15 or 20 to 25 years, but now it's over 50 years. Wow. Yeah, and so you know, it's it's time probably to to close the job to close the mill, and and there's a lot of jobs at stake. But to be honest, there if the mill stays open. They're talking about starting to begin pumping the mill, the mill effluent into the Northumberland Strait. So, you know, there's 3,000 fishing licenses there. Oh, wow. So there, there are more jobs at stake. The, the fishing industry is, is billions of dollars in Atlantic Canada. Yep. The, the pulp and paper industry is nowhere near that. Yeah. It, it, the fishing industry is at least 10 times greater. Mm -hmm. So we have economics. We have the economic argument on our side. And we have the science on, on our side. And we have... The experts, the mill engineers, and things that we have the the facts are, are on our side, but the money's not on, on our side. Sure. Like in terms of getting the information out, there's, you know, because Northern Pulp, the mill has rallied the union and and rallied the forestry industry because when jobs are at stake, they fight harder, right? So yeah. we don't have uh, the money on our side to get the message out. So thank God for 
people like Ellen Page who have been helping us. Yeah, absolutely. And I will definitely share and uh, put the links in the podcast Thanks, notes. Thanks, brother. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, get the message out there. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, you know, maybe the, the listeners here will at least like and share. And uh, maybe my Buffalo friends will share with some of our oh, Canadian sweet. friends. Yeah, you know, hey, man, we're not the that border. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Buffalo is awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love Buffalo so much. Spent four years at Canisius College. It was like the best. You know, yeah. I, I grew up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, which is yep. like, you know, mid-Atlantic region. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> I went eight hours north and fell in love with it. Totally yeah. different experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Would go over the border, you know, go to the yeah. nudies and, uh, you know, drinking yeah. ages 19, you know, go to the yeah. Falls yeah. View. Yeah. Meet some characters up yeah. there. Oh, geez. Yeah. Don't want to run into the Mounties up there either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're looking for college students. Yeah, man. actually, yeah. American Ontario will be the OPP. <laughs> yeah, the Ontario Provincial Police. But, uh, yeah, we get the, yeah, the Mounties. He's up there pretty pretty good, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Dave, is there anything else that you wanted to mention before I ask you three silly questions? And you already uh, answered one of them uh, inadvertently, but we'll, well get to that. No, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, oh, this is great. Pretty appreciate it, yeah. You're amazing. And, Dave, you know, before we rack up, uh, DaveGunning.com. Yep. And it's yep. Dave underscore Dunning. Uh, or, um, I keep saying Dunning, Gunning. God, yeah, I yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah, Gunning, G-U-N-N-I-N-G. We'll, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll credit that to the beer that I'm drinking and the sun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Dave underscore Gunning um, on Instagram. Is it the same on Twitter, too? Uh, I think it might be. And then the website's DaveGunning.com, and the Instagram and Twitter are linked to that. So you can, uh, yeah, DaveGunning.com. And, and the name of the new album one more time? Was Up Against the Sky. Up Against the Sky. Yeah, That's yep. awesome. Yeah. So I, I ask these three questions to everybody, yep. uh, and they're very. And the more every time I ask these questions, it's a uh, more prominent musician. So I asked them to Steve yesterday, and now yep. I'm here yep. with you. Holy uh, shit. Last year yeah. it was uh, David Miles. Oh, uh, the other, yeah, 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 a lot of Canadians on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love Canada, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first question is: What is the first album that you ever received as a gift, or uh, you went out and bought that yourself? But uh, the question is: What's the first album you ever got? The first one I that I bought with my allowance was uh, was Abba Super Trooper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back you in just the made my wife happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. Any yeah. reason? What's the story behind I it? I loved Abba when I was a kid, and I had these beautiful babysitters. I I, I was always saying, to Mom and Dad, you know, you guys should go to the movies and we should have a babysitter. <laughs> they had these gorgeous <laughs> girls, the the Corbin girls from. And the Bateman girls from down the road, they'd, they'd get us, they'd have them babysit us. It's like, oh, man. And we would crank ABBA and dance on the coach and have these parties. So I just, uh, you know, that's, maybe that's why I loved ABBA. <laughs> My second question is, uh, what was the first concert you ever attended? But you mentioned Stan Rogers yes, yeah. when you were eight years old, yeah, right? Yeah, 1981 so Stan Rogers concert. Where and we went, we went to see a, an artist named John Allen Cameron. That's what, took, that's what drew us there. It was at the West Pecto High School. We didn't have a theater in our area. And it was at the West Pecto High School gym, and uh, Stan Rogers opened the show that night. So that was my wow. first experience. Yeah, it was. A, but we went there to see John Allen Cameron, who was w w another one of my heroes, Amazing. who I got to play with. I played bass for John Allen. Really? Yeah, in the late '90s. Wow! Wow! Anything else memorable about that concert? I remember funny Stan, smells? Stan <laughs> Rogers broke a string during the Mary Ellen Carter. Oh no! And way. I and I I didn't know like. I, uh, he, he was pounding the twelve string guitar, and there was a string hanging down, likely the high G string, because it's always the one that breaks on those on the twelve string. <laughs> and uh, he had the the old Par sixty four lighting cans, you know, they'd be hot as hell. Yeah. And it was a red one right in his forehead, and he could see this blood vessel like pulsing on his head. And his <laughs> head was sweating, and he was pounding up the Maryland car with a string hanging down, just a powerhouse, you know. And I was sitting in the front row, just like. Like, you know, what the hell is this? You know? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my final question for you, Dave, and thanks again for all of your time. I really appreciate oh, thank it, man. Thank you, Sean. Um, what, is your, what is your favorite soundtrack from a movie? Sleepless in Seattle. Really? I don't know why. Do, hit, hit me with some songs because I can't uh, remember. I've seen um, that movie a million times probably. A uh, kiss. A kiss. It's just a sigh. You know, it's just like it had all these great romantic songs, and I think my I had just broken up with my girlfriend at the time, so I would say that, that that it. had some influence on why I like that. But there's like Doctor Doctor John is on on that on oh. that album, and and uh, just like there's some great great Harry Connick Jr. is on it. There's some killer killer songs, and it was it was remastered really well. So when the Louis Armstrong cut, it's like 
a really good version of his cut. Like I, I, they must have, whoever mastered. Like I love good sounding records. Sure. Whoever remastered that record did an incredible job uh, creating consistency from track to track. And I, I, I don't know. I just love that Sleepless in Seattle. And I had never seen the movie. I just liked the soundtrack. And I think I had joined Columbia House at that time. That was, you know, back in the day when like a, a, a CD would show up and you had 10 minutes to get to the post office or it was yours, you know. And I think that maybe that was the selection of the month or something like that. And I just so I just happened to get it by default and, and didn't have time to go to the post office. I thought, shit, this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, Dave Gunning, thank you very yeah. much for being on the podcast. Thanks, I really Sean. appreciate it. Yeah, and, uh, I can't wait to listen to your podcast. Oh man, yeah. the Steve Foltz interview is something I'll, else. I'll he, tells, he tells some. Oh, uh, he's so good. He tells some crazy <laughs> yeah. stories, man. He tells some crazy stories, you know. Yeah. But uh, but you've been wonderful, Thanks and uh, and me. welcome back to the Philadelphia Folk Festival. I hope we see you here again. Thanks so much. Take yeah. care, man. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It's really interesting. We're lucky it happened, actually. You're lucky I don't know your fucking head in. There's no need to get violent, is there? I'm trying to swear for that, please. You can always put in a fucking bleep, can't you? Yeah, yeah, that's not the point, though. No, no, that, that's not the point, is it? The point is, the point is how come you think you can interfere with the way we talk and not interfere when the fans button down? Yeah, right. Answer that and stay fashionable. Come on, boys, let's keep cool. We don't know what you Mmm, it does go well with a chicken. Delicious again, Peter.